Hey, welcome everybody back to another LinkedIn Live, a YouTube Live, wherever you're watching live on Facebook. Uh, welcome into the home. Welcome to the house. You got your cup of joe with you because it's the afternoon and we have a phenomenal guest I'm about to introduce you to. But first, we want to make sure that you all are getting on. I know that we are having these great conversations with Mindsight Maximizers. Uh, and my name is John Register. I'm your host for this. And so as you're getting ready and coming on, we're just going to do a few little particulars, as we always do, just to begin to start this show. All right. So uh, I'm your host, John Register. I'm um, the, I, I identify as the international keynote speaker, a change mindset warrior. And I work with successful business professionals to actually help them hurdle adversity, amputate fear, embrace a new normal mindset to win the medals that are in their lives. So what's the mindset to mindset? Mindset is our, our current state and where we are. Mindset's where we're trying to go, what, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to mm -hmm. achieve in our lives. So uh, mindset has us, you know, we've reached a plateau, we may have reached a destination at one point, but hey, we gotta refill the car, we gotta put more uh, fuel into the wings, and it's time to take flight again to where do you wanna go? Where do you wanna be? In life, so that's what we're talking about from mindset to mindset. That's one of my growth things I did last year, actually during COVID. So this show is all about getting you up and close and personal to those individuals that, that are able to have these kind of courageous conversations, these dynamic dialogues with us um, to help us maximize our mindset. And that's what we're going to on, on this show today. So visit my website at johnregister.com to get all my social media handles. We are out there just doing a lot of work. The team has grown by one. Again, we continue to push into the space. Instead of going backwards, instead of getting people, letting people go when COVID first hit, I started hiring people because I needed a, a, a place to think so I get my mindset absolutely right. So the podcast, um, the team is going to make all these and turn all these things into a podcast. And I'll let you know when that will happen. So you can have your own favorite show right at your fingertips when you're on your walk. I know Lynn Keir is out there doing her walk right now down in North Carolina because it stopped raining. And so she's listening in and tuning in right now with us. And if you have anything that you want to say to our guest today, please put it in the chat box. That way we can uh, bring you up, uh, shout you out, uh, and then we can uh, answer your question. So all shows are existing in their full form uh, in their entirety on YouTube, LinkedIn, and in the Facebook group. So please subscribe and hit the notification button. Uh, there to show uh, how you can actually share this program with others. Okay, so those that are, if you are not familiar with my journey, real quickly, just I'll do this every show because I never know who's coming on, who's seeing me for the first time. Um, and uh, we we get some people that are on there live, and people will see the show uh, afterwards. So we want to make sure that you know why I'm doing this show. And and so at at, at five twenty nine in the afternoon on May seventeenth, nineteen ninety four, I was one of the world's fastest hurdlers. Now, at 5.30, I would never run another hurdle in my life. I missed up the hurdle, dislocated my knee, severed the artery behind the kneecap, and then just a short seven days later, I became an amputee. So what does that do to your mental state? Uh, for me, I started going down a downward spiral, started saying, you know, who am I now? What's my identity? Is my wife still going to still stay with me? Is my son still going to see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams were over at that point. Well, at, at 5.00, uh, at, at 5.30 and some change and seven days later after my leg was amputated, uh, my wife comes in and she says to me, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. And with those words, I really began shifting and retooling. And, and now what I call the mind sight was looking at where I could become, who I could become. The little glimpse of a vision that I had. It wasn't the whole thing. It wasn't the whole full picture. But I had a glimpse that my truth could actually outweigh my fear and I could commit to a courageous life. So I started swimming for physical therapy, got fast in the water, made the Paralympic swim team just 27 months post my amputation, started um, uh, running with an artificial leg uh, that summer, and uh, four years later won the silver medal over in Sydney, Australia, um, and setting the American record in the process. I went on, and leaving legacy was to build a military sport program for the United States Olympic Committee to use a, a program that uses sports as a tool for the rehabilitation of those who are wounded, ill, and injured in the defense of our country. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. And that's what we're talking about today. I know we have a few people on. If you are in here, please let us know where you are streaming in from, what platform you're using, and uh, please put it in the comment section so that we can shout you out. So each guest really has done similarly in their life. They have uh, 
overcome some type of obstacle. They and I we don't talk about really the overcoming of the obstacle because had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. We usually don't get back what we have let go of uh, in, in our lives. So I'm going to shout some folks out to us some faithful watchers on here before we introduce you to the amazing guests that we have on today. Lynn Kier's always on, so I got to shout her out. Um, Diana Parker is always on. Patrice Ravenscross always gets on. And Richard Biddles, I saw him over at the Olympic and Paralympic Museum. He's always on. And everybody kind of stays incognito sometimes. So uh, so if you're out there, you know, please let your, your voice be known uh, because we have a dynamic show for you today. Please share this platform uh, and watch uh, from the chat box. And please listen to your favorite shows in the past because they're they're all dynamic. And we have some amazing future guests that are coming on, as well as some guests we had all during the month of May, which was inc actually incredible guests. So let's meet the one we have in the green room right now with us. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait to have this conversation with this young lady. She's just remarkable. She is a rock starette, and uh, she's just fantastic. So, But let me do her the propers. Got to do the propers. So she is a marketing expert, a motherhood mentor, and Miss Georgia USA Global. She's often called the modern day superwoman as she effectively founded Claxco, a Claxco Media, a marketing firm serving entrepreneurs and small business uh, superwoman because she is raising not one, two, or three, but six kids, y'all. Six <laughs> kids. Is she a farmer? What's going on? I've got to have her. Please welcome the one who can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan, and never, ever, ever forget. The kids get into school and practice and lessons and dinner and dinner and laundry and law while back <laughs> a phenomenal career. The one and only Natasha Kozart. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I thought we were going to have George Jefferson come around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> beans. You know, on the, in the kitchen, was it? Um, beans don't burn in the kitchen? Like yes. That. Yes. All of that. Took, took a whole lot of trying just to get up that hill. <laughs> Just to get now we're up to the big leagues. <laughs> Taking our turn it back. <laughs> yes, as long as we live in just you and me, baby. And I, lo I love that part because it reminds me of what your, your wife said. This is just our new normal. Uh, so he said, "Ain't nothing wrong with that because we're moving right on up." And we that's are, what you've been right doing. Up. We are moving yeah. right up. So listen, uh, Natasha, we got some folks that just come on. They're they're here. I want to shout them out. So we have. Doug Spooner, Colorado Springs. He is in the house today. So thank you, Doug, for being on. He's one of the folks that's that's doing the, the media over at our church. And uh, he's a rock star. And I just snagged his wife to be <laughs> to be my executive. Hey, Doug. <laughs> on. And we have Lynn Kears. She's out doing her walk. Every, the sun's coming from Charlotte where the sun has come out. So she's heading out for a walk, taking the conversation with her. Wow. So enjoy your walk out there, Lynn. I had my walk this morning, two miles I got in. And a mile swim, so go take that, right? Uh, wow. And then, uh, do I ever feel lucky that I lost my leg? Not sure I felt lucky about using the mm. leg, but it has actually uh, taught me a lot of lessons. Uh, of, of I wouldn't, I, if I had to do it all over again, uh, I'm not sure I would do it all over again. However, because we're in this moment right now, I don't look at the past. I look at where it actually, remember the mind side, look at where, it, what does it mean now and where can I be in the future because of it? So mm -hmm. that's what I I'm always talking about. Absolutely, Doug, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's a great question from the Facebook user. Put your name in the chat box right there because I would love to know who you are. So it is absolutely great to see you today. Um, thank you so much for saying yes, Natasha. Uh, it's and, my pleasure. Uh, so I want to start there. I want to start with the six kids, right? So six kids, how does that happen? I mean, I know how that happens, but I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I know how it happens, but you know, there, that's a lot by today's standards. What mm -hmm. possessed you all to have six kids? It it literally felt like an overnight situation. I was newly married, happy, happily married, and uh, literally afraid to ever have children or get pregnant. I grew up in a single parent home, uh, and I was always taught from a child, you know, you can go out and do whatever you're going to do, but you better not bring no babies home. <laughs> so I carried that mindset into my marriage. I was literally shaking. I didn't even want to tell my mother I'm pregnant. And uh, when we had that conversation, she said, you know what, honey, it's okay. You're married. <laughs> That's what pr married people are supposed to do. And once I began to embrace that, I, I realized the motherhood unlocked something in me that had been lying dormant for years. Mm -hmm. It was a sense of belonging, a sense of care for something bigger than myself. 
And it was a sense that my life could make a difference, that I, the things that I say, the way that I care for this being who is in my possession now uh, could literally change generations ahead of me. And, uh, and so it was just a distinct honor. So you say b- belonging. That's interesting. I wrote that word down. So if you see me going over here, I'm, I'm just trying to take some notes. Uh, belonging. Yeah. For the, do, you, do you think that's, that's something that a lot of women will experience when they, when they first become pregnant for the first time? Like, like this belonging that comes I in? Think, I think that's what you're supposed to feel. Now, there's different, many different contexts that children come into the world. And I've actually experienced a myriad of ways where you you get pregnant, but it's unexpected. Or you get pregnant and you want the child and you nurture and you bring it in. Or you get pregnant and you're like, I don't want this baby. I've been on all ends of the spectrum. Um, But it wasn't until I matured myself as an adult that I was able to embrace the reason that my body was created, the reason that woman exists. Um, And I know there are a lot of different trains of thought out there that say, you know, women are more than their bodies. But anatomically speaking, my body was created with the womb to carry life and to give life. And once I embraced that, it really helped me um, understand my reason for being. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's a great answer. So what what came up for me during that time is when... uh, my wife and I were pregnant with our first child, which wasn't, we were not married uh, during that, that time. Uh, mm-hmm. I experienced, I, I, I knew she was pregnant before she did. So I started getting all these sympathy symptoms or whatever you want to call it. But wow. I was going on, I was doing all sorts, and I went back and said, are you pregnant? You know, that, and I, didn't, I didn't know why they even came out of my mouth. She said, no, I don't think so. So she went to the doctor and yes, we're pregnant, right? Lo so, and behold. Uh, so, so I, I got, so I knew that. So both kids. So in the second time we're on the soccer field and mm-hmm. I were, I, she's sitting down, I'm sitting down next to her watching our, our, our son, John Jr. play soccer, uh, who's now like six, seven years old. And, um, I smell breast milk and, I, and it was, it was <laughs> coming from her. I mean, it was like, and, and you know, that smell, and I knew that smell, right? So I, I knew that smell. So, and, uh, so I said, are, are you pregnant? <laughs> and she said, what? What are you talking about? No, I'm not pregnant. She goes back to the doctor. Sure enough, she is pregnant. So I don't want to smell breast milk ever again. Wow. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to be throwing off. <laughs> We're good. I'm good. Two yet. <laughs> it was it. So we are done. Um, so, you know, it sounds, it sounds like you have a, a very busy household, you know, with, with, with six mm-hmm kids. So and I kind of was making a joke, you know, you're doing all these things there. How do, how do you manage that in a full-time business? Well, it, it starts with focus. Um, I, I did research when I was in graduate school and I researched other women who were like me, married or single, but with multiple children also working or either in school full-time. And the overwhelming consensus was that we survive by one single thing, and that is by a faith focus. Um, and if I'm going to put it bluntly, they said God, it mm-hmm. was their relationship with God. That foundation is what kept them centered and grounded. And then everything else in their life um, was really guarded by order, by structure, by planning. Yeah. And so um, there's a big difference between just living your life and then living your life on purpose. Yeah. Uh, and the time that it takes you to plan a day and to be purposeful about your action is the time that you spend wasting doing other things. So instead of wasting time and reacting to things that happened, I found a way to be proactive, to plan the things that I want to see, and then learn to manage the change that comes into my life, learn to manage the conflict so that I'm not taking it back so that, you know, five years from now, or even five months, or even, you know, five days from now, you wonder, I made a goal. How, how, how is it that the living room is still dirty? <laughs> and a lot of mothers will understand, why is it the laundry is it done? Okay, well, who's going to cook? And, and, and that's just the domestic things. Okay, you know, did we bring in enough leads into our company? Were we able to convert? Did we have any events happening? You know, who's, who's accomplishing those things and how are they getting done? Well, it'll all get, you know, thrown by the wayside if there's not focus and then planning. Yeah. So with so those we, two things, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so when you talk about the focus, I want to go back to the faith focus. And so like yeah. when we're talking about, you know, and, and, and God-centered focus, right? So mm-hmm. kind of in that, what was it specifically that you found kind of worked for you 
uh, in, yeah, we, we talk about goals, but what were the steps that you took? Could you kind of outline your, your process, your system of making sure, you know, those things were being taken care of? Well, first of all, I'm just really transparent. Okay. Um, people come into my life and they look and they say, wow, you're a superwoman. And at first that used to really offend me because I felt as if they were telling me, Natasha, you're trying to do all and be all for everyone. And you just can't, because that's what I was hearing is you're doing too much. It's overwhelming. If, if I were you, as people say, if I were you, or if it were me, I wouldn't do that or I couldn't handle it or I wouldn't manage. Well, what I had to do, number one, was 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 be vulnerable and say, you know what? I, being superwoman doesn't mean that I have to save the whole world, but I must save my world. So I had to be vulnerable, accept responsibility for the life that I've created. I'm the one that <laughs> created six children. I'm the one that has to manage this company. And so as I embrace responsibility for that, I, I that vulnerability comes in my relationship with God. So the first thing I do in the morning is I wake up to pray, I meditate, and I have that time alone with him. And that is what centers my day. That mm -hmm. is how I get started. And many times I have to get up earlier than everybody else. So I may be up at three, four or five in the morning. Um, but that's the quiet time in my house. And that's the quiet time in my life. And I love it. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm, well, I, you just triggered something for me. One of the questions mm -hmm. I was working with a client the other day, and I, I just gave him a homework assignment. And the homework assignment is what, and, and everybody else that's maybe listening out there right now, you can kind of do this one too. And that is what Natasha was talking about is getting a, a centered place, a quiet spot where you can meditate. Mm -hmm. And where is that spot for you? So I want you to answer that question, where that spot is for you. But for you that are listening out there, where can you find that spot? Where do your ideas most come to you and flow to you? And what time of day is it? Can you begin to put that into a practice where it becomes a kind of almost ritualistic for you? Because you know, 99 times out of 100, you're going to get those insights and those breakthroughs because you put yourself deliberately in that spot. So where is that spot for you? Well, that spot for me is typically on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, right. Uh, it's either on the floor or in, I have this nook in my bathroom that yeah. is um, a little bit oversized and I will go and hide there. Here's the thing. When you're pregnant, as many times as I've been pregnant and as long as I was pregnant for 10 years, either nursing or giving birth to someone, your, your sleep pattern is so irregular. And mm -hmm. so I found that instead of fighting what was happening to my body and fighting the changes and the, the ups and downs. I just leaned into them and I embraced them, which means if I'm awake at two, three and AM, hey, this is the time that I'm going to maximize. I'm not going to try and force myself into a mold, but just lean into where I am. And so that's the pattern that evolved. And like I said, it's usually the bathroom because <laughs> no one's in there. When I was married, I'm divorced now, but when I was married, um, you know, he couldn't find me in there. The kids couldn't find me in there. <laughs> no one can, can, you know, you just lock the door and, and hide away. And you know, strangely enough, I, I made it a fun place. I made it a, you know, a place where I had my little blankie tucked away. I had a stool there with my Bible and my pen and my notebook that no one would play with. It's not something that the kids would get into, um, but it was just my sacred place and my sacred space. And I also had an opportunity to journal my process. And um, that was very, very therapeutic. And also, um, I got a, a good source of grounding there as well because I'm somewhat of an external processor. I talk out loud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, I think when I talk aloud, that's what I'm trying to say. I think when I talk aloud. So writing helps me do that, um, do that process with me and myself in the notebook. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think when I, when I talk aloud as well, usually it's in a walk, like I, I, when I'm up walking the neighborhood or a lot when I'm mm. driving the car, I turn the radio off. Mm -hmm. And I'm real. I, I just, it just ideas just start coming, and I have my, you know, my cell phone next to me, and, and doing some memo, you know, some audio memo notes. My wife, she goes her her spots up at, at, at the at our zoo. So when 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 I'm in the doghouse, oh. <laughs> and, and so she likes <gasps> the, the monkey cage, right? So she goes the, the gorillas, um, and yeah. so she finds peace with 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 that with them, and there's like some coves there, and so if ever I need to find her, mm -hmm. you know. That's where she's probably going to be. So I think different people have different spots of where their ideas most, you know, come to them. And so I, I want to kind of shift a little bit and talk about um, your business of, of classical media. It's how did that come about as you're kind of managing the household, um, and then you're going to all, all of a sudden start this business, or was the business already there? Help me understand that. 
Well, what happened was I had a bit of, I'm just full transparency. I had a bit of a victim mentality. Mm. I was really upset about my divorce. I was upset about the fact that things didn't work out for me. Um, I was upset about my financial situation. So one of my very great mentors gave me a job. But my first job that I had with her, she refused to hire me as an employee. She would only hire contractors. So she says, well, if you have a business, I can hire you. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to do, but I figured it out. And that was the beginning. I had a client who wanted to pay me and I had to figure out how to get paid. Wow. <laughs> so it was by default, but it was also by pressure. Well, so did, I had to change my mind. You got to go back. And yeah. How did you, I mean, so you get you to, to the place where you're going to, um, you know, I can only hire contractors. So that's pushing you out to a deep end. You got to figure it out. How did you figure that out? I mean, that's a, that's a big step. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm a resourceful person. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have Obviously. a thousand bucks to pay an, a, an accountant or anyone to start a business for me. I couldn't hire anyone. I definitely had to figure it out myself. So yeah. I went to the internet. I also um, went down to my local um, city, city office. And I said, how do I do this? Help me, show me what's next. And for less than a hundred bucks, I was able to get rolling. Oh, awesome. yeah. That's In the so state good. of Georgia, but that was the course, you know, over 10 years ago, but it was, am I going to remain a victim um, of circumstance yeah. or am I going to become a victor and take authority over my, or take responsibility for where I am and make the life that I want. Someone's yeah. got to take care of these kids. Somebody's got to bring home the bacon. Somebody's got to <laughs> fry it in the pan. You know, uh, and I wanted to be the one who's in the in the kitchen cooking. And so you, you started focusing in on entrepreneurs. So you become an entrepreneur. Now you're starting to focus in on entrepreneurs. Was that what I mean? Yes. Give me the why, why is the entrepreneurship the, the, the niche that you wanted to go down? Well, it's a bit of both. Once again, I had another mentor um, mm. who I was working for their company and they wanted a little bit more. So they, they were teaching me how to service and outsource my, my services to small businesses. So mm -hmm. for example, marketing, um, many companies around after that 2008, 2010 uh, market crash and things were rebuilding, they had gone to another model where once again, they weren't hiring employees, but they wanted to um, have the, the resource or the, the, the benefit of having a department such as a marketing department without having to hire marketing people in. Yeah. So as I developed my portfolio, I, I created a list of services that would be able to cater to what a, an entire small business could need and provide that as kind of an outsourced department work. Well, as I was doing that, I met leaders that says, well, hey, thanks for doing this for my company, but can you do this for me too? And as I saw the need develop, I realized, wow, there's a specific niche for leaders who are in a corporate setting but are wanting to transition because they want more control of their life. They want more control over their financial future. They want to build that legacy. And, um, and they were experiencing, once again, a lot of adversity as it pertains to being a minority in a corporate setting. And so there's difficulty when you're trying to climb the corporate ladder many times in, a, in, a, uh, in corporate in America because of sometimes skin color, sometimes because of gender, sometimes just because of bureaucracy. And when you can, you know, jump off as an entrepreneur, enter into the knowledge economy, and you can really lead, you can speak. There's a lot of different things you can do. Well, hey, a lot of the same things we do for a corporation, we do for entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of picking your horse and riding it. <laughs> Pick your horse and ride it. Yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> the group we're in. Um, you know, you, you, you focus in on this, these uh, the entrepreneurs, and um, I got to, I have some thoughts around that I want, I want to kind of come okay. back to. But first, I want to mm -hmm. just take a little quick little break and just say to the audience out there, hey, if you have a question for Natasha, um, please put that in the chat box. I'd love to know uh, what your thoughts are right now on the conversation. And of course, we have the all uh, encompassing and the and the great uh, fabulous five questions I'm going to ask her coming up soon. So stick around for that. Uh, that she has to answer, and it's the first thing that's on her mind. Um, so, what you know, if you if you if you if you've taken something away from the conversation already, please put that in the chat box. Send that out to your your groups. Uh, put the at sign for Natasha and put her out there to all your groups and to alert them that that she is on right now. Uh, and we will, of course, be having this in the podcast format as well. 
We still have Doug on. Thank you, Doug, for Doug saying thank you uh, for for sharing. Um, um, he, he was talking about for us, uh, talking about calling him out for Colorado Springs. And so if anybody else is on, please let us know. We want to make sure that we uh, shout you out and and uh, uh, honor you in, in this respect. Okay, so in this in, in the entrepreneurship, right, there's a lot of stuff that happened during COVID. How, how did you have to shift during COVID? And then be part of that question, what did you learn from it? Honestly, when COVID first hit, I was super excited. I was excited and then overwhelmed at the same time. Excited because for years I've wanted to just be home, to be present. And I feel like a lot of times parents trust their children to the nearest iPad or to the, the you know, the video game nanny. <laughs> and so you've got Minecraft that's watching your children or you've got some YouTuber that's teaching them about the facts of life. And mm -hmm. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be present. And even the research that I did before showed that Father, dad can go off and run the world. You can be a superhero. The kids absolutely love you. You walk through the door, you're in good. But if mom leaves the home, um, even 13% less of the time, then it has a tremendous impact on the life of the child. And uh, so no matter what, there's just no way mom gets out of being engaged and present with the kid in order for the kid to be the best kid they can be. We all know a bunch of Jeffrey Dahmers and, you know, Serial murder. So, I mean, all of these guys who've done the, the worst things you could ever imagine in life. You wonder, did they have loving homes? Did they have mothers who were present and, and caring? Um, and, and, it, and it leaves you to wonder, hey, am I raising a kid who's going to contribute to society or that's going to, you know, send us to hell in a handbasket? <laughs> uh, and that's just our biggest fear is mom. We don't want to be that mom <laughs> who's raising the next Bill and Ruth. <laughs> um, Nobody thinks you're doing that, but but that's that's just the reality. So COVID, I think, um, forced us as parents to rethink our parenting and to rethink our relationships. Do you even know the people that you're living in the house with? Mm. Do you even understand what they're about? You know, do you have you even really spent time together? Uh, I, I noticed that a lot of marriages were being challenged and as well, relations, just relationships in general, because we don't know each other. So um, I was excited for that opportunity to get to know them. But then I was doubly challenged because I'm like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to manage six, six different households, six different computers with six different children, with six different teachers and, you know, six different schedules all day long. So needless to say, I was exhausted and I did give in to the fatigue of it. And I just became an all around gamer mom. That's what I call myself. Like I'm a gamer mom. If we're on Minecraft, I'm on Minecraft. If we're on Fortnite, I'm on Fortnite. My kids taught me everything I needed to know about every video game, uh, you know, Roblox. If you name it, I know Roblox. it. Rainbow Six Siege, Call of Duty, GTA. Uh, I like to consider myself the cool mom until, you know, until I have to not be cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was a little bit of both. And for a long time there, my business was really at a stalemate, but I had things in such a financial place where I didn't miss a beat. Um, and we were fine for quite a while. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, I, it's, it's interesting you say that. I, I, I found it, I found a lot was both ends of the spectrum, right? So there were those that were having that uh, coming together as a household again and kind of get re getting to know people. That was one thing. And then some folks that were coming together and said, I don't even want to know these people anymore because <laughs> you get, get out the house uh, to yeah. what we were doing here was, we, you know, walking the neighborhood together and, and sometimes, you know, running into uh, people we never would have met because now we're mm -hmm. walking the neighborhood and, and taking these times. So I found that the things that I said I wanted to be like being at home, uh, and even though I, I was, there's some remnants, of course, like you said earlier, um, I, I see my children doing a lot of things that, um, you know, kind of ways of which, I, which I did. But yeah, mom was was always here uh, in, in some type of capacity to, to the point where she she took on a role of, you know, uh, there was a job offer that came up with driving the, the school bus when we were living oh. in Virginia. And you could take your you could take your children on with you. Right. So. And they paid well. They paid oh. really well. So she took my daughter Ashley on. So she was going to all the museums wow. and everything downtown. So we really stayed very close uh, in the evening times and uh, as you know, as as a family. So uh, I, th I thought that was interesting that you, you say that because a lot of folks I think found um, kind of this newness. The other, other side of the spectrum was that 
after a little after a little time, folks were like, I, I need the schools open so they can go back. Right. I, well, I, I don't I my grade as a teacher is an F. And it's, <laughs> Listen, I, I, I call my, my children passed by the skin of their teeth. I said, all of y'all are sneeze away from repeating this whole year all over again. <laughs> like if anybody can have straight D's, our family pushed the boundaries of the borderline uh, just because it was that challenging. But I'll tell you one other thing about COVID, um, John. It was an I told you so moment. So I had a lot of opportunities to look at my clients and say, you know what? Told you so. I told you to build an online business. I told you to develop your online platform. I told you you needed to have that social media presence. And they were like, oh, I can't do business. I can't function. I don't have an event. I can't go speak. A lot of my clients were speaking or traveling or everything that we're doing was based upon people physically being present and showing up. And so uh, that kind of felt good. <laughs> it felt good, but also we had a solution. Uh, so I was able to partner with a few um, different clients, especially one that we both know together um, with um, Dr. Avis Jones, the Weaver is also another one who have been able to build six figure, multi seven figure businesses based upon digital marketing strategies that have always been around. But yeah. you would think during COVID people didn't have money, they didn't have resource, but there were actually quite a few um, industries that were really booming and doing so well during this industry. And the, the knowledge economy is one of those. And, and, and say, say like one more time, the, the, what was it? The knowledge economy, people who yeah. are speakers and teachers yeah. um, who share the things that they know, um, coaches, consultants, man, that's really taken off wonderfully. Yeah, I, I, I found that I didn't really want to get into the coach space, but I, I went very deep as a um, in, in my uh, not I won't call it niche. It's it's not because mm -hmm. it's not really a, I don't really have a, a specific group that I talk to. It, it's more of the mm -hmm. idea of embracing what we embrace. So I'll, I'll get people that will come on from all all walks of, of life. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I, I went deeper into what I wanted to deliver uh, to them. So you, you talked, you know, a couple of times about the divorce and your divorce. So how did how did divorce really impact you, you know, going from this kind of two, this dual household, you know, now in, into one? Well, it was it shook everything that I knew. Mm -hmm. um, even though I was raised in a single parent home, my faith and my belief was that um, the intent for family was to be, you know, husband, wife, children, raising together, building a future, leaving a legacy. And so for that to shatter was, um, was an insult I felt to um, my dream, my vision. It was an insult to my identity as a woman, as a wife. And I felt like a complete failure. Um, mm -hmm. And I mentioned this before, but I felt like a victim. And uh, I felt like, well, why did this happen to me? Uh, how, how did I allow myself to be in such a negative, hurtful, um, in, in, in a non-productive context. I, I honestly, I literally lost myself. I lost wow. my identity uh, and I had no idea where I was going. I was, you know, I was just coasting through my days. And that was the lowest, lowest point. Coming out of that, I have reemerged almost like uh, like some hybrid flower <laughs> that never existed <laughs> before. Uh, and I, I understand what it means to care for myself, to understand myself, to believe in myself. And, and I don't want to yeah. make it all like a self-focus or self-declaration. Uh, but a lot of things, if you don't put the mask on yourself first, if you're on a plane and it's going down, you know, they say, you know, put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then you can turn to help and save others. Uh, right. I spent so much of my life saving others and sharing with others, helping others that I had never truly focused on the me and the, the hurt that was happening and um, the abuse that was happening in my own life, in my own context. And I'd never felt like anyone had fought for me. So mm -hmm. I had to learn to fight for myself. Wow. fight for my children, fight for my future, and then realize that nothing is wrong with fighting. That just because I'm fighting doesn't mean that I'm argumentative or that I'm a contentious woman <laughs> or that it'd be better to live on the rooftop than to live on the house with me. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it meant that I have a voice and I deserve to be treated as a respectful human being and that my words matter, 
my desires matter and that my identity, my sanity matters. And once I was able to convince myself of that <laughs> and believe it and truly receive that, um, it has been probably one of the best things to happen to me ever. I'm not bitter about it. Uh, I, I wrote a book earlier um, and it's called Ratchet Mom. Okay, ratchet is a term that is used in popular culture for those women that you see in Walmart that's just going off. <laughs> you messed up my hair, you know, or just fussing and acting out of character and just really being overly expressive, what people call just going over the top, doing too much. But the reason behind that is you're emotionally overwhelmed. You're living in an abusive context. You're financially underprovided for. You're living off of a system, typically a government system that was never provided for you to succeed. It was meant to just give you enough so that you would never leave. <laughs> um, and so you feel trapped, you feel overwhelmed and you have this desire maybe on the inside of you for more, for better, but you don't have a pathway or you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't know how to get out. So it just blows up in what seemed like the wrong french fries at McDonald's. <laughs> or, you know, it becomes this amazing display that ends up on the front of the news. Well, that ratchetness can be turned into righteousness if you're given the tools that it takes to move from where you are to where you wanna be, to live better, to do better, to overcome the adversity, to hurdle it and to keep going. Um, and yeah. so that, for me is, is the result of my divorce is, hey, I'm not living a bitter life. I'm living a life that is righteously healed. I have a voice, I speak for myself, I can fight for myself, but I know how to heal others and bring them alongside me. And you gotta you gotta follow her on on Instagram because she does these lives that are off the charts. They're they're really good. And <laughs> I'm, I'm always, I'm, when you ever you come on, I'm like, oh, Natasha's on. I gotta I gotta get on there. Um, <laughs> yes. so your lives are really good uh, on, on those. I, I was thinking about. I always close with a, a quote from Anais Nin, uh, and okay. she says that. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So that kind of yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. It's pretty. That's that's one of my favorite quotes. Wow. Um, that when you we're talking about our fear, I, I have this whole program on fear to freedom. Uh, the jump, I say, the jump is your jump and your jump alone. No, no one can make you do the jump. They can encourage you. They can mm -hmm. support you. Yeah. But no one can actually make you do the jump. And so people want it. They want a book that tells them how to do the jump. They want. 10 points on this, five points on that. Mm. You have to make the jump yourself. No one can mm -hmm. no one support it. If you don't make the jump, if you don't do it, then you have to justify all your actions or inactions of not living courageous. But if you do make the jump, then I call it now living in the a rebirth area because you're building upon a new foundation. And that new foundation kind of, um, it's it's hard, it's difficult. We're, we're trying to, we have what I call phantom pains of the old life. Um, you know, the good I want to do, I don't do. And then the good mm -hmm. I, I would like to do, uh, the, the good I don't want to do, that mm -hmm. I do. Right? So yeah. we, we're, we're, you're kind of in that space. You've you got these phantom pains of what's going on before you. But when you get strong enough, you have this resolve. I'm resolute. I know exactly who I am. And it's mm -hmm. not braggadocio. You, I'm, just, I'm never going back to the way it was. You need to catch up to where I am right now in this moment. And that equals our liberation to then uh, go back and help somebody else along with it. And that's exactly what you're mm -hmm. doing right now. You're helping others uh, make it through the, the challenging and most difficult times of their mm -hmm. lives. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's exactly what you said. We have to make that choice to jump on our own. Um, deciding to file for divorce was the most difficult decision I've ever made in my life. Mm -hmm because I did not want to. I did not want to admit the context or the life that I was in. I did not want to um, upset any. Mm -hmm. um, I did not want to break the, the, um, the stereotype or the ideal of what other people thought my life was like. Um, and I think the moment you can get over the fear of other people's opinion yeah. and the fear of pleasing others, what will people say? They think everything is perfect. They think we're the textbook family. 
the moment you can get over that, the moment you can be honest with yourself. Uh, we all know in Georgia, I live in the Atlanta area, it's snake season. Snakes are everywhere. <laughs> they are so slick and they can sneak in and they can, um, they can sneak into any crevice. And, um, and you don't know they're there until you begin to disrupt their environment right. or until you're cutting the grass or moving rocks away or until you're in the garage and you're, you're, you're trying to organize or clean and then they come out. And that's what happens with our fears. We don't know they're there until we try and do something different or we try and leave that sphere of limitation or we're trying breaking past those glass ceilings and those limitations. It's like, where is this self-sabotage coming from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, why am I just laying in the bed and I just don't feel like doing anything? And why am I now overly emotional about everything? Why is it that I can't take the next step to just put in the paperwork or press send on that email? Mm -hmm. There's an underlying fear there. So we've got to be honest with ourselves and allow no hidden thing. People lie to others, but the worst person to lie to is when you lie to yourself. You can deceive anyone on the road. You can deceive your neighbors. You can deceive your spouse. You can deceive your children. But the worst deception is self-deception. That's a quote from Dr. Cindy Trim. The worst okay. deception is self-deception. Because when you begin to believe your own lies, you'll always be stuck in a place of victimization. Yeah. But when you can be true and honest with yourself, and realize that I am where I am because of the decisions that I've made, but I'm always only one decision away from living the life of my dreams. You'll be willing to make that next decision. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what we have to do. That's, yeah? that's so good. Um, uh, we, we were talking with Natasha Cozart and what a fantastic conversation we have been having. Uh, if you've been enjoying it, if you pick something up from Natasha, please put in the chat box, shout her out. Uh, because what a what a fantastic uh, young lady we're, we're speaking with today. Hey, you also are a a, a Miss Georgia USA Global. What, yeah. what, is, what does that mean? Global, like you're <laughs> Georgia, global, like you're you in a country of Georgia or the 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 the, the state of Georgia. Well, we're starting off in the state. What that means, the pageants that are in the United States are, um, there's several different systems, kind of like going through a university. You can have a, a degree of awesomeness <laughs> from an Ivy League university or college. And it's similar to that. So the pageant system that I'm a part of is called USA Global. Uh, but here's the most exciting thing is this is a pageant, not just like any other, where they're judging you on your body and, you know, the style of makeup and the clothes that you wear. This pageant is all about your life impact. And the people who are chosen and selected are those who are not only um, a portrait of beauty on the outside, but have beauty radiating from within. Meaning that your life is not just about you, but how are you reaching out to care for others and lead others? And so I was um, selected by the state of Georgia to be able to lead the charge. My platform is to empower single mothers uh, and give them the tools they need to break out of victimization into victory, um, to become entrepreneurs who can leave a legacy for their children, as well as manage their career without having to feel like they're sacrificing one for the other. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I didn't. I didn't. Didn't know. I mean, I. I uh, well, I won't go into the, my pageantry days. I, 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 got roped, I got roped into one by a by a, a person I was working for the Olympic Committee, and, and his wife was a Miss yeah. Colorado, and he was in the doghouse, I think, and said, "I got to get. I got to get somebody to judge this 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 contest." I'm like, could you do it? I'm like, no, nah, I don't do that. Wow. That's not in my wheelhouse. So my daughter just had just done one. I was up there supporting her. So I said I said yes to it. It was interesting. I I, I learned a lot. I, I probably wouldn't do it ever again. But it, it was. Uh, but I, I learned a lot and, and actually made some really amazing um, friends as far as uh, the, the the causes that these young women were were going after. So you know, even one mm -hmm. with uh, she was wearing a uh, um, a patch for uh, what is it uh, diabetes. Right, and so I, I thought that was it was amazing that that became her platform, and she was doing that, and she continues it on. Wow, this thing. it's really it was, it was it was pretty fantastic. So well, okay, one of the other know, things that yeah. as you said, one of the other things that we do is we highlight people of color, and yeah. 
And so you'll find that in a lot of these pageants, you may not see women of color being represented or right. women of anything less than a toothpick shape. And right. everybody knows that as a mother, we've got hips and lips and fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a place for us to be who we are and express ourselves. Secure, and secure. Just, <laughs> yes. And just so you know, the title of Mr. and Mrs. Colorado is still open. So oh. I'll just throw that bug in your ear. I know Miss Colorado. She's a very dear friend of mine. But Mr. and Mrs. is still open for the 2020, 20, uh, 2021 year that's well, coming up in October. Okay, I'll tell my wife about um. it. <laughs> <laughs> you said that really quickly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Uh, so, okay, we're gonna, we do this thing on the show every every time, uh, every time show. And it's, it's a quick... Um, kind of five things that uh, they're really simple questions and you can answer them really, really quick. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with like three, three other questions after this. And you can ask me five questions as well. It can be the same five, or uh, you can, you can just come up with five other questions you want me to answer real quick, throwaway questions. Okay. Are you ready? We're going to, okay. we're going to, we're going to change it. We're going to change it down. Nah, we're, we're in close now. The close up. <laughs> All right, here we go. We are JR's five round of five right now. Favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni and bacon. Pepperoni and, and bacon. <laughs> Love it. No, we, we can hang out. Okay. Plain M&M's or peanuts? Plain. Plain. Okay. Plain, Jane. All right. Well, what what you have for breakfast this morning? An impossible sandwich from Starbucks. Ah, okay. All right. It was okay. First time, not a huge it's fan of impossible sausage, but... It wasn't horrible, so. All right, well, let's go try it. Uh, animations or cartoons? Cartoons. Cartoons, okay, she's a Bugs Bunny lady, all right. Uh, how yeah. do you explain what you do to an eight-year-old? Oh, very easy. I help people make money. <laughs> there you go, I love it. <laughs> all right, so those are, those are the five for you. You got five for me if you want, or we can go on to the next question. Mm. So, life as an amputee, does your foot ever itch? Your missing foot. It, it's it's uh, it's it's itching right now. Are you serious? Right. I always see yeah, it. Always, it always. I can always feel it when somebody asks me about it. Wow. <laughs> okay, you travel a lot. What's the most amazing place you've ever been? Oh, wow. Mm. So many come to mind. The one I'm thinking about right now is actually in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi and the, the huge mosque. That's what's coming in my mind right now. Yep. Mm. What's the most amazing thing about your wife? Uh, she knows everything. <laughs> 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 She has a steel <laughs> trap memory. I can't get away with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of woman. <laughs> She's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so, so so many amazing things about her. That that's one. The, the other is she sp she's an action person. And and even those um she'll tell you even this, you know, if the text and everything in a book might not always come together, but when it's time to act, she's the act actor. She's an actress. She, she is the um so she works as a flight attendant for an airline, and when she was on uh, one, when she first started, they were landing into a field in um, uh, Ontario, California. So they're on final descent. There's a boy in the back of the plane with his mom and dad. He's choking on a piece of candy. She springs from the, her seat, gets back there. This is a three. She's on a small plane. This is a pilot, co-pilot, mm -hmm. just her. So she's got locked doors, and all she has to do the action. She jumps back there does the Hamilton over, gets the candy out, uh, gets this kid situated back again, and then gets back into her seat. Now, you can either do that in a textbook. Wow. Or you can do it for real. And she's the for real one. They had a, they had another incident on a plane just recently. With, I won't go into it because it was actually a horrible incident. And she mm -hmm. sprung into action and got the person actually moved. Uh, and, and, you know, because they always deal with a lot of, a lot of nasty stuff that's going on. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but she handles those things exceptionally well. Yeah. Wow. Well, maybe she's the real hero. <laughs> she is, she's the sure. woman. Salute to her. Absolutely. Wonderful. Hundred percent. Yeah. 
All right. That's three by my count. But you got two more? I do. What's your favorite candy? Uh, m and peanuts. m and with peanuts? Really? You like, like the opposite of what I like? <laughs> and <laughs> lastly, favorite movie? Uh, the Incredibles. Oh, yeah. What about Incredibles 2? Did you like that one? I did. I liked I liked one better. I I, I because of just the the storyline, but I did I did like mm -hmm. how they 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 um they expanded Elastigirl. And then at the end of the movie, if you if you watch the end credits, they actually do all the theme songs for every one of the uh, Incredibles. So Frozone has his song. Mr. Incredible has a song, and wow. Elastigirl has her song. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I have a musical family, so we will literally listen to the score of our favorite movies in the car. Um, yeah. Right now, The Mandalorian plays the most. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, Star Wars versus Star Trek. Oh, good question. Oh. Mm, probably early. Oh, wow, that's hard. I'm a Trekkie. I, I think I'm a Trekkie. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Trekkie. I, I mean, I watch Star Wars for sure, uh, but I think... Um, yeah, I, I like I like Star Trek, the early Star Treks. <laughs> okay, and then, then last one. Oh yeah, and so and I like to love Var Burton. Like he just was a household guy. You know, he was right, yeah. reading Rainbow. I then he's you know in Star Trek. He's he's just a household name. So I'm happy that he's coming to Jeopardy. I can't. Well, the black guy's got to be blind man with the black glasses. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to have an impediment. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, but then, you know, just having blind, I mean, that's, you know, I have to have a, the, the, the Ray Charles glasses. You know, it was, but anyway, that, yeah, I, I, I thought it was, that was pretty cool. So what's the last one? I forgot. Okay, no problem. <laughs> so well, thanks for playing. I, I appreciate that. that that's, that was good. I, I, I like that. That was, that was, that was good. I haven't been asked those questions before. So, okay. Last three questions before we wrap up here. Uh, greatest fear you have seen people overcome in as an entrepreneur or in the business that you mm. run? Greatest fear they've overcome? The greatest fear I've seen people overcome is investing and taking a risk. And what I mean by that is putting a financial, monetary investment next to what they believe in. So mm. whether that's starting a business for the first time, whether it's hiring a coach, or whether it's um, you know the things necessary in order to implement their business, I think that is the hardest, the hardest thing to overcome. But when you can take that next step, you're able to see results that are beyond belief. Like if I could do this, if I could make this level of investment, if I could go there, I can do anything. Yeah. Talk, talking about it versus being about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just a, a little short story behind that. Um, when I was going through my divorce, I was three months pregnant when I, when, when, you know, the process started and, um, we were separated while I was having my last child. And because of the context, um, I was alone. He refused to come to the hospital with me, refused to show up in, in the support, you know, this, the birth of his last child. So I sat home, I combed all of my children's hair, got all the girls, the girl's hair braided, packed all their bags. Um, and I said, I'm going to have this baby on a Friday night so that I can save two nights in the hospital, come home, and then the kids can go back to school on Monday. Everybody can go back to work because I didn't want to inconvenience anyone taking care of my children. I literally, to the second, finished my daughter's hair, packed my bags because I was in contractions uh, all day. I was in labor all day. I drove myself to the hospital while I was in labor parked in the parking garage because I did not want to get a ticket from being in the ER. Oh my gosh. Walked myself to the triage. And, you know, when I walked in, I said, guys, I'm in labor. I need a wheelchair and I need to go directly to labor and delivery. And they said, ma'am, there's no way you can be in labor. You're too calm. <laughs> wow. and, and as soon as I'm looking at you now, I said, ma'am, I understand the way that I look. But I, I need you to know this is not my first rodeo. I am definitely about to have this baby and I need help now. <laughs> and when I put that emphasis on now, they were like, okay, I think Miss Coastar needs what she needs. <laughs> they willed me back. I was 10 centimeters dilated. They were frantic. Within an hour, I had given birth, natural childbirth, no medication, no anything. And 
I was sitting in there ready for my cheeseburger. <laughs> um, and that, John, was the hardest thing I had ever done. Number one, to have a baby alone, to endure everything around it, to remain calm in the process, and to have no medication. Because I was thinking, at least I can have some drugs to get me through this thing. Um, and I couldn't even rely on an epidural or any drugs. I had to face it embrace the pain, lean into the moment. Mm -hmm. And I delivered a healthy, beautiful baby girl who is the life of the story. So if you see my social media and you see that little girl who's always in the camera, she is truly a bundle of joy. Wow. And I knew sitting in the hospital that day that if I can do this, I can do anything. Yeah. And that's what I reckon you know, that's what that's what I believe the challenge is for entrepreneurs. You find that one thing and do it. And if you can get through that, you can literally do anything. And that has been what has shaped me for the remaining 10 years of my life. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think I know what your, your North Star then is. I was going to ask you that question next, but, uh, but I'll just ask it anyway. What's what's your North, your guiding principle, your North Star when, when things go all the way down? Yeah, it's something that my mother drilled into me as a child, and it's a Bible verse. It says, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. No matter what it is, I told her, Mom, I can't do this homework. I literally was in the third grade, second grade. I said, I can't do it. I don't know how to do math. I don't know how to spell the words. And she would say, don't say you can't. Tell me the verse. And yeah. she would make me recite that verse over and over. And it has <laughs> literally become my North Star. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that that it comes a lot of I know a lot of folks have said that. I know all the chapters are really talking about prayer and how we can do mm -hmm. with the, the prayer emphasis on it. Um, and then um, how do people connect with you? How do they get to Natasha Kozart? Yes, I am at Natasha Kozart on all social media platforms. Kozart is spelled just like the word Mozart, but with a C. Okay. So I am there. I love to hang out on Instagram for fun family stuff. LinkedIn is where I do teaching. Facebook is where you're going to get a hodgepodge of a little bit of everything, work, business, and family. We're on Clubhouse. Uh, we have great conversations there. And uh, yeah, it's just an honor to, to be on your platform, John, to get to know you a little bit more and to forever be inspired by your leadership and uh, in your oh. words. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. We have Lynn. Just, she's so inspired too. She's inspired by you. So she's been on. She's the one. She's been on her walk. So she must have just gotten Hi, back. Hi, Lynn. She's she's been fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah. So wow. Thank you. We've learned so much today, and I I thank all of you who, who have you know stuck with us uh, through this this uh, our, our the last hour. Uh, we always try to go between fifty minutes and an hour. So we're at our time, but just thank you so much for being on the insights that you have given to us, Natasha. So uh, stay on for a few seconds and uh, as I wrap okay. this show up. Okay. All right. all right. So ladies and gentlemen, wow, what a, what a great show. We've been talking with Natasha Kozart and um, what a fantastic, fantastic interview. Please rewind the tape, put the A-track in, push forward, skip, 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 so you get back to the beginning of it again. Uh, and that does it for our show for this week for Hurdlers of Adversity, conversation with these mindset to mindset warriors. And uh, you can just see why, wow, that last one, the last story just kind of really did it for me as well. Uh, hey, I'm on KPPF Radio, uh, the tactical advantage, now streaming live on podcast channel Podbean. So get out there. It's a local show for Colorado Springs community. But if you're coming to Colorado Springs and you want a local show, uh, go on and get it. But it's on Podbean stream, so we're global with that as well. I do have the book out right now still at 10 Power Stories to Impact Any Leader. Uh, please go get it on Kindle. And then join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash amputate fear. And we're out there doing that, uh, having conversations. I wanted to be more active in that space as well, because we have some really interesting things that are going to be coming up for you. Uh, we already talked about the quote for Anais Nim. The other one is, when truth outweighs fear, we commit to a courageous life. We commit to courageous acts. Uh, next week's guest is going to be Olympian Ivan Lee. Uh, he started this, um, he came out of the uh, Peter Westbrook. Academy in the in the uh, in Harlem for fencing, and uh, so he's one of the world's greatest fencers. And we're going to talk with him about his Olympic experience. Uh, and you can follow him, get out there, talk about Ivan Lee. Just follow him uh, right now. We are going to be on a little bit earlier, so watch and make sure that you are 
uh, tuned in because we will be on a little bit earlier. I will be on travel in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we're going to do it from a remote location, but the timing is just not working out. So we will go on a little bit earlier. Haven't decided exactly when that time will be. So Ivan Lee will be on next week. And remember, you are the inspirations. Inspirations are the catalyst to motivation. Motivations in turn causes actions, action leaders to transformation results. And those results that re-inspire us will allow someone else that's watching the process to catch the vision. My name is John Register saying, go forth, inspire your world. We'll talk to you a bit later. Bye for now.